Some things are on my heart today and I want to share them. Appreciate you joining me today on this YouTube channel, Last Day's Awakening. And thank you to so many who have subscribed. Bumping closer and closer to 10,000 subscribers. That's exciting. Appreciate the opportunity just to share my heart and share the Word of God with you. And thank you as well to so many who have added comments, uh, whether those are comments that discuss the issue, uh, show contrasting views, or what have you, and especially those encouraging comments that have come our way. Uh, thank you so much. Appreciate that. But I ran across a passage, uh, again, that I haven't read for many years as far as study goes. I've read over it in my yearly reading of the Bible. But I want to take you back there. So go in your word, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 26. And in the middle of this three-chapter uh it's really a three-chapter love song between Isaiah and the Lord, picturing Israel having come out of uh, captivity, uh, also God's chastisement for their sins, uh, and being reborn. So it, it, it's just a beautiful passage of Scripture, but tucked right in the middle of it at the end of Isaiah ch chapter 26 is a rapture verse. It's, a, it's, a, it's literally a verse that we can see clearly the whole process of the great catching away, the harpazo. And once again, those of you who get stuck on that word rapture, please don't. Uh, there's no need to get stuck on it. I know many will say that the word rapture is not in the Bible. Neither is the word Bible. I've said that over and over as well. The word rapture is simply the Latin translation of the Greek word harpazo. The English translation to harpazo is catching away. And so it all works, whether you're reading Latin, whether you're reading Greek, or whether you're reading uh, in English. It's the catching away. So if you're more comfortable using that word, fine. Many deny that it will happen. However, it's here. So I want to read from this passage. I and as I read in Isaiah chapter 26, uh, you're going to hear some things that are very, very familiar to you. I'm going to start in verse 16, chapter 26 of Isaiah. Lord, in trouble they have visited you. They poured out a prayer when your chastening was upon them. As a woman with child is in pain and cries out at her pangs when she draws near to the time of her delivery, so have we been in your sight, O Lord. Where have you heard that before? Does this not sound like Matthew chapter 24? We have been with child. We have been in pain. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. In other words, all of their uh, pain and all of their sorrow has not produced what they want it to produce, and that is the eventual birth of God's kingdom. We have not accomplished any deliverance in the earth, nor have the inhabitants of the world fallen. In other words, righteousness has not come and the judgment has not come. And then the Lord answers this word that Isaiah is giving prophetically. Now the Lord answers. This is almost a sing song. There is a song being sung to the Lord and the Lord is returning the song all in a prophetic way in the words of Isaiah. Verse 19, listen to this and then we're going to break it apart really quickly. Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body they shall arise. Awake and sing you who dwell in the dust for your dew is like the dew of herbs and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. For behold the Lord, this is verse 21, Behold the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood and will no more cover her slain. What an interesting use of words that we find in that passage of Scripture. Your dead shall live, together with my dead body they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust, for your dew is like the dew of the herbs, and the earth shall cast off the dead. Now you will realize that three times in that passage the word dead was used. And 
we're going to break that down because it in English all we get is the word dead. You know, it's it's one of those situations where different words are translated in English as the one word dead. The first word is this, your dead shall live. The word is moot, and that word is from Strong's 4191 and described as those who are dead and in the grave. So, you know, someone passes and and uh, we have the funeral service for them and we take them to the cemetery and, and they are interred in the cemetery. Uh, that is uh, the expression here that is being used, a body that has been interred. Now for, uh, for saints of that day or for people of that day, they, they will have been tucked away in a cave or uh, a particular place that is a, a tomb that the whole family would use. So someone dies, they are placed in that tomb. Okay, so your dead shall live. It's talking directly about the resurrection of the dead. Now, earlier in this chapter, the expression is given by Isaiah that those who are wicked and dead are not going to live. So this is talking about the righteous dead. This is talking about those who have believed on the, on, on the Lord, have, have believed by faith, have trusted the Lord by faith, and just as it was with Abraham, they're... Their faith is accounted to them as righteousness. The law, we know, can't save anyone, and obeying the law isn't going to save anyone, but believing by faith and following the Lord by faith uh, is accounted as righteousness. So the righteous person dies, they're buried or placed in the cave or wherever they are. They are moot. They are dead. It's also where we get the idea of the word, uh, usage of the word moot in English. It's a moot point or a dead point. That's pretty cool. The next line goes on and says, Together with my dead body, they shall arise. Now, this is an interesting word because this is the word nibala, which uh, we see in Strong, number 5038, which means dead of itself. The usage is throughout the Word of God in different forms, but this is, this is an idea that really sounds interesting to me and tells me something about the resurrection because the righteous dead are going to rise together with what the Lord says here, his dead body. Now it takes us to two places. Could this be the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead when he came out of the tomb? The scripture says there were the righteous saints who rose with him. So yes, it could be this. But I also believe that it's a, a picture or a type or another suggestion of the greater resurrection and the time of the rapture when his body, his dead body, will arise. You say, well, they're not dead. Well, the word nabala means that which dies of itself. And that doesn't mean suicide. That means something completely different. And for the believer in Jesus Christ, this is a, this is a principal thing that we need to understand that we technically are here walking this earth. We are living dead. That doesn't mean we've died in any other way except to ourselves. Which takes us to Romans chapter 7 verse 4 which says, Therefore, my brother, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Romans 8.10 And if Christ is in you, I love the way Colossians 121 says that if Christ be in you, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. But this says, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. In other words, the law was fulfilled by Christ. And then, of course, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life uh, which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Because of what, has, what happened when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, the crucifixion of Jesus becomes actuated in us. And we are positionally in that place where we died with him. And if we're dead to sin, Romans chapter 6 says, how can we uh, if we're dead to sin, how can we live any longer in that sin? So what it means is we now live dead. We are alive to Christ. And even though we still wrestle from time to time with the effects of the sinful nature, we're no longer bound to that sinful nature. We have a new nature in Jesus Christ, and we're part of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 
verse 27 says, Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. It's kind of showing the picture of the body. So Christ is the head, we are the body, and each of us form a member, and we're not all the same members. So we're the body of Christ. And so here Isaiah uh, is receiving this word from the Lord that says, Your dead shall live, the ones who are dead in the ground, and my dead body, this picture of the body of Christ, will rise with them, together with them. What does that sound like? First Thessalonians chapter 4. Verses 15 through 18. And uh, the dead in Christ shall rise first. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up, harpazo, together with them in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So this is, this is, a, this is a beautiful statement being uh, given to Isaiah of a future catching away. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. There's an exclamation of joy, and this is, this is the Lord speaking, and he says, Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. And there it is. For your dew is like the dew of herbs. In other words, that which fell into the ground is, is, not, is not gone. It's just simply producing new life, and, and that's what will happen on that day of resurrection and the catching away. And then comes the next usage, and it's the last usage in this passage, it says, and the earth, this is interesting, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Now, there's the third usage of what we translate from Hebrew into English as dead. This is Strong's number 7496. It's the word Rapha. And Rapha is talking specifically about spirits of the dead. Now, you could look at it positively, you could look at it negatively and say the spirits of the dead. But we know something, you see. We know something. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So this isn't the casting off of people who died in Christ and are in some sort of soul sleep. We know immediately to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So our spirit goes to be in the presence of the Lord when we die. Our body goes into the ground. So what's this talking about? This is the word Rapha, and the word Rapha forms the very root word of the term Raphaim. And it's uh, talking about the spirits of the dead. These are the spirits of the dead that remain on the earth. You say, oh, Pastor Jim, are you talking about ghosts? No, I'm talking about demons and where demons came from. And the, and the very clear picture here is in the words just before Rapha, and that is the words cast out. The earth will cast out her Rapha. The term cast out is the word nafal. Now, some of you who have studied this before are now starting to say, oh my, oh my, I get this, I get this, because the word nafal shows up again in the plural form in Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis chapter 6, that plural form is nephalim. Now, listen to this. Genesis chapter 6, verse 2, 1, starting at verse 1, pardon me, now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God, B'nai Elohim, these are, this is a term strictly used for angelic hosts, so picture in your mind, these are angels who have fallen, have uh, rebelled against God and are part of the rebellion of Lucifer. The B'nai Elohim saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with men forever. In other words, what he was seeing take place really uh, demonstrated that the gene pool, the, the DNA of men were being corrupted, that something was being created that was not in any way, shape, or form in the will of God. And the Lord said, My spirit will not strive with men forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. So from that moment, the Lord decided 120 years until the flood would come. And so this is the process of God calling Noah to build this ark that would save the eight people and two of each of the animals of that time. So this was going to be a time of judgment that was coming. Now verse 4 says, there were giants 
on the earth in those days. And the word giant is the plural form of nephal, which is nephalim. These are the offspring of fallen angels who took, abducted them. Can you say that? Ab took them to themselves, as many as they want, and they produced this, this hybridized race of giants. Giants in the earth. These are the nephalim. So they were there before the flood, and listen to this phrase, and afterwards, in other words, something happened again. This is not a one-time occurrence, this actually happened again. When the sons of God, the B'nai Halohim, came into the daughters of men, Adam, and they bore children to them. These were the men, mighty men, who were of old men of renown. The word uh, men here, or mighty men, is Gabor, which means tyrannical giants. So there's the reaffirmation there were giants in the land. These are the Nephilim. The offspring of the Nephilim are, are also known as the Rephaim or the Zamzumim or the sons of uh, uh, the Anakim. And, and of course Goliath came from that line of the Anakim. All of these came from uh, this terrible moment or moments because it's in plural form here before the flood and after the flood. This happened in Canaan where fallen angels took human form. As Jude says, they left their prior estate, committed this abomination, and they were banished to the pit, never to be released, bound in the bottomless pit. It happened on more than one occasion. So these Gabor, giant tyrants, were the men of renown. In other words, these this race of of individuals, this race of people, this race of hybridized, uh, how, how do you even describe it? This, this, this terrible race were famous. They were feared by all. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So what happened to these Nephilim when the flood came? Or these these Nephilim descendants from the second occurrence in the land of Canaan. And there are some great studies on this. L.A. Marsuli does some great videos on the Nephilim. Uh, Perry Stone does some great videos on the Nephilim. Um, Michael Heiser, Dr. Michael Heiser. But understand that when these creatures died, when they were uh, killed in the flood, or when they were judged, with death when Joshua entered into Canaan land with the children of Israel, their spirits, their spirits roam the earth. These become the unclean spirits, what we would call demonic spirits. And these are what Jesus dealt with. And by the way, we have authority over these spirits, these unclean spirits in the name of Jesus. So the scripture here says in Isaiah that the earth, after, the, after this resurrection of the dead, and this rising of the body of Christ, there would be an expulsion from Eretz, the earth, the ground of the dead spirits. In other words, there would be a time when the demonic spirits would literally rule on the earth. Now listen to this as it goes on in chapter 26. He says, Come, my people, and enter your chambers. This picture of a wedding picture of a marriage. Shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. Wow. Listen to Jesus' own words as he talks about what he is planning to do from John 14, verses 1 through 4. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many many chambers, the word here, mansions, that is translated in the King James Version or New King James Version actually means chambers or apartments, rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also. Now, some would say that, yes, Jesus is going to come, and yes, there will be a rapture, but we, we just follow him right back to earth. But that doesn't take into account what he just said, that he's going to prepare a place for us in Father's house. 
the new Jerusalem itself does not descend from heaven until after the millennial reign of Christ. So this is not a post-tribulation rapture. This is a pre-tribulation rapture before the indignation comes. Now there's an incredible word. The indignation is the word za'am. Strong's 2195, if you want to look it up in your Strong's Concordance. It means to froth at the mouth with fury and rage. So God, as, as he goes on here and says, the Lord... The Lord, in this time of indignation, for behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth of their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood and will no more cover her slain. It's, it's very much like uh, Genesis chapter 4 when Cain has killed Abel and now God approaches Cain and says, the earth is crying out with the blood of Abel. So Abel's blood is crying out from the earth. It's very much like that, that all of the blood that has been shed, all of the innocent blood that has been shed, think of the millions upon millions of, of abortions. Think about uh, the, 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 the numbers of martyrs over the centuries for Jesus Christ. Think about the innocent blood that has been shed. The earth is going to cry out and is now crying out for judgment to come to the wicked. And the Lord says it's going to happen. It's at a, a time of indignation. It's a time when his fury will be poured out. This is all coming about. The picture here is, once again, of the resurrection of the righteous dead being caught up together with his dead body. This is the body of Christ that is living dead to sin and alive to Christ will be caught up together. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the harpazo, this moment of catching away, and then the indignation on the earth is going to run rampant. You do not want to hang around for that. Those who believe in an in a evangelical or Protestant purgatory are just plain wrong. You say, what do you mean, Protestant purgatory? Well, the idea of purgatory within the Catholic Church is that somehow our sins have to be purged from us before we're counted worthy to go to heaven. And here, here uh, they're doing the very same thing. I, I never thought of this on my own. Uh, my dad shared this with me, who years in ministry that he had, and, and the saying of a, a great Pentecostal preacher named C.M. Ward, who used to have the Revival Time radio show, talked about the... Protestant purgatory, and that is that we think somehow that we have to go through the tribulation period to purge the body of Christ and make it without blemish. Listen, this happened because of the blood of Jesus Christ. We are made pure by Him. As we separate ourselves from this world, or at least the worldliness of the world, we are running and moving constantly towards Jesus. Our life is drawn to Him. He's our purity. It's his righteousness, not by any works that we could ever do. We live righteously because the Spirit of God lives in us. We are no longer bound to the old nature. We have a new nature in Jesus Christ. And so it's his purity. It's his righteousness. And as we look to him, Jude says, to that, to that blessed hope of his appearing, then uh, the joy will be ours to be taken uh, in this thing called the harpazo, the catching away. Do you follow? So don't wait around to have your sins purged. Trust in Jesus. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life I live in the flesh, I live by, the, by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's ours now. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. All the old is gone and everything is brand new. That's what we count on. That's what we live by. Listen, Jesus is coming soon. He's coming for the righteous dead. He's coming for the body of Christ. And when that happens, all hell is going to break loose on the earth. Ruled by demons? You want to hang around for that? It's the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the time of purging of Israel to prepare them to receive their Messiah. It's not the time of purging of the church. Be a part of the body of Christ that goes with the Lord on that day of the catching away. Listen, through the help of the Holy Spirit, we can do this.